Good morning, good morning. And it's Friday. I hope everybody's having a great week. And they all had a great uh, holidays. And we are getting ready to finish up our final lesson in Exodus. And so what a, what a book it's been. And so let's, uh, I'll finish up here and have a few remarks about the, uh, in general about the book. And the plan is to continue and head right into Leviticus starting Monday. So uh, start with a little introduction and we will start looking at Leviticus, the third book of Moses' Pentateuch of the five books that Moses wrote. But let's finish off this one. And that the uh, tabernacle is finished and the Shekinah glory arrives for the first time. Uh, God is going to be with his people again, like he was in the Garden of Eden, sort of, except that they're in their sinful state. So there's a lot of rules attached to it. And a lot of that we'll get into in, in Leviticus about all the different uh, festivals and all the different practices. It'll be fun. I think it's uh, I think it really shows the the uh, personality of God as we go through these beginning books. It helps us to set a base for uh, our understanding of the Lord. So I will uh, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you, Father, and thank you so much for all that you give us, Lord, all the help you give us in so many ways, uh, our housing and our food and our and comfort and our knowledge, uh, and we can you know, all apply it to you. Because it's, it's because of you, Lord, that you, we receive all these benefits. We give you praise and thanks for all you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so... Starting off here in verse 20, chapter 40. And we get the verses up here. And we will start with a picture of the tabernacle. And we'll probably head in. I don't remember what's in these particular verses. We'll see where it goes. I got plenty of pictures. And he took and put the testimony in the ark and set the stars on the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. Okay, so now I know where it's going. Let me change the picture. I wrote this a couple of days ago, so I was trying to think where we're at. There we go, the ark. He took and put the our testimony inside the ark. Let me... That was the testimony. We put the testimony inside the ark, set the stays on the ark, and put on the mercy seat above upon the ark. That was the testimony inside the ark. And then we got the uh, ark itself. Verse 21. They brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covering the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. I'll run through these pictures afterwards. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. So again, he's setting up the uh, tabernacle here. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil. And he burnt sweet incense thereon as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle, the tent of congregation, and offered upon it the burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the labor between the tent of the congregation and the altar and put water therein to wash with it. And Moses and Aaron and his son washed their hands and their feet therein. When they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. So I will uh, 
bring up a different picture for a minute here. And we will go through what that just basically said. So there's the ark. You put, place the ark inside the uh, Holy of Holies and put the altar of incense in front of the uh, area in the Holy of Holies. And put up the showbread and with the uh, table of the showbread. And then you lit the candles of the, uh, of the menorah. So you can see that room and you can see this area back here is the, uh, behind this curtain is where the... Uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat are. And then he put the, he hung the door at the outside. And then he set up the labor, or they were going to wash up, make sure it was full of water. And he set up the, uh, now this is the uh, uh, brazen altar where the sacrifices were done. And then he set up the uh, outside of it all the way around, including, and also put the tent over and all that stuff. They set the gate. This is the gate uh, where you get in with the uh, with the uh, uh, linen embroidered with beautiful uh, tapestry. And that's the entryway, only one way in. And so it's complete tabernacle setup. Back to our other depiction. The next thing is going to have, be happening is the. Uh, that part is kind of glory but so let me get uh so i just basically read through the rest of the uh, most of the rest of the chapter and moses finished the work when the tabernacle was finally assembled it was an earthly model of a heavenly reality since moses was instructed to build and arrange everything according to a pattern it isn't surprising that we see elements of this tabernacle arrangement in the bible's description of heaven so let's compare so here we got the Ark of the Covenant, which rep represents the throne of God. That's in Revelation 4, 1 through 6. As I looked, now this is John up in heaven, seeing the actual uh, where God is sitting uh, in a vision. As I looked and beheld, a door was open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you these things which be hereafter. So John has uh, just been... Uh, symbolically raptured up to heaven and he's going to witness what we're going to witness i believe when we arrive there ourselves after the rapture and immediately i was in the spirit and beheld a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was there to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald and around about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon those seats i saw four and twenty elders sitting i really i believe those that represent the church clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there was seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god and before the throne there was a sea of glass like under crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind so that's the throne room the Ark of the Covenant representing the throne of God. The lampstand and the labor are corresponding to the heavenly reality. Now moving on to the next phase in Revelation 8, 2 through 4, the altar of incense. If I can get a little visual, I'll just keep switching back and forth between these. Uh, 
all proof of incense. We already mentioned the uh, uh, lamp stand and the laver, which you just saw passing by there. The altar of incense, we see this in heaven also in Revelation 8, 2 through 4. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So you can see here the golden altar, and the throne is right behind this curtain. Verse 4, and the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So I believe that the actual uh, altar of incense is sitting in front of God right now. And the next phase is the tabernacle structure itself. We'll just put this picture up. And that's in Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one has six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one created unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and who earth is uh, full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And said, I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. So again, symbolically talking about the fact that uh, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the altar of uh, sacrifice and the washing of the word, we are allowed to enter into the temple. And that actual veil that is uh, that is there currently, it was ripped in two when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And now we have access to God. So the tabernacle structure is implied by the mention of the temple and the brazen altar uh, described in that passage. And the next phase is talking about this uh, sacrifice in Hebrews 9, 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. In other words, Jesus came from heaven, so it's a better sacrifice than what was normally sacrificed on this altar, which is uh, sheep and goats. Goats. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of figures of this true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. It tells us at some point in time after the cross, Jesus actually entered the heaven reality represented on earth by the tabernacle and appeared in the presence of God to offer the perfect atonement for our sins. Therefore, every time before this event, when the high priest made atonement in the earthly tabernacle, he was basically play acting uh, or looking forward to the perfect atonement of the Son of God would offer. Again, a pattern. Okay, so that gives us an idea of the, the overall structure of this uh, tabernacle. Now let's talk about the Shekinah glory. And from this day forward until uh, God leaves the, ta the temple, that would be uh, uh, the temple that was built by Solomon about uh, 600, around 600 BC, about 586 BC uh, is when God left the temple. So for almost 500 years, he spent, he was with the people uh, here represented it in the uh, Holy of Holies. So let's look at this. It's Exodus 40, chapter, uh, verse 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I don't have, really have a good picture of this. I think I might. I, mean, I was just thinking of what I used to have. I don't know if I still do it.
Maybe not. This is kind of the close uh, proximity of it. We'll keep that open now. You can see here you got the menorah and the showbread. And it all represents, and there's the uh, brazen altar. And it represents Christ. And they're talking about the, uh, uh, the law, uh, that no one could keep the law. And it was only by the sacrifice of Christ that uh, showed us that uh, why we needed a savior. So that picture is basically depicting. So what the so what the Shania, so talking about glory in Ephesians 2 22 in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the spirit. So what the Shekinah glory was to the tabernacle in this temple that the spirit is to is to the holy temple the church and to the temple which is in the believer's body. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. First Corinthians 6 19. What? Uh, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have you have of God, and you are not your own. You are paid with a price, is what that is basically talking about. As a price was a sa sacrifice of Jesus Christ on a throne. Okay, Exodus 40, 35. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode therein, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So while God was in there, though, there was, it couldn't even go in there because his, his glory is so great that we can't be in the same presence. This is spoken of uh, in Leviticus 16.2. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, and he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Also 1 Kings 8.11. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Second Chronicles 5.14 So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Did I read that twice in a row? No. Same thing, in, uh, same, almost the same exact thing in, uh, in Kings and uh, Chronicles. Also in Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7.2 and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. That was identical. Isaiah 6, 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with his smoke. And Revelation 15, 8. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of the God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. We will witness that part. While we're in heaven, I'm also looking forward to getting to the next phase of God's plan, whatever it may be. Okay, finishing up here, verses 36 through 38. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. So basically, that would, if the, when God would lift Himself up from out of the tabernacle, that told the uh, Jews it's time to time to time to go. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This is a beautiful picture, uh, beautiful evidence that God did answer Moses' prayer. Uh, I remember way back in uh, Exodus thirty-three fourteen. I, there was a question mark there because of the sin of the uh, uh, of the uh, golden calf. Uh, refresh your memories here. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. At first it, he had mentioned that he was not going to go with the children anymore because of their disobedience. And uh, Moses pleaded with God and they, uh, uh, he changed his mind. Well, I don't think he changed his mind, but he was uh, he was testing them. Uh, so God's presence was with Israel, despite the golden calf tobacco. So this book ends with the fulfillment of a promise. We saw there in Exodus 29, 45. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. Yahweh is living among his people.
So the book of Exodus ends with a great hope and trust in God through Israel was in the middle of a desolate desert, had fierce enemies in the promised land, and was weak and liable to sin and rebellion. God was with them. This gives us a great cause for faith and confidence, confidence in ourselves. God has seen it all. Uh, he is and he's still faithful to us. So to speak of a journey is to look for an arrival. He will he he who has begun a work of salvation for Israel will complete it. Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we see God entered into this tabernacle and would reside with the children of Israel for the next 900 years. So this is where we're at right now is 1491 BC, and it won't be until 594 BC uh, when they uh, when God leaves again because of the sin of uh, of the people of uh, Jerusalem. But because of the sinful ways just prior to that, the captivity in Babylon, God will leave his people. That's in Ezekiel 10, 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in, their, in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of God of Israel was over them above. So they watched him depart, and he hasn't been back since. Except when Jesus came, and they didn't recognize it, though. <laughs> Until a time still future, and it will happen, uh, he will return. And then it's, that's in Ezekiel 43, 4 through 7. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. This is talking the Millennium Kingdom. <clears throat> so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the, Lord, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings, by their whoredom, nor by their carcasses of the kings in their holy places, high places. And but when but what they didn't come to know is that Jesus did come, and they did not recognize him. And in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, Jesus answers uh, the ultimate question posed, posed to them during Jesus' time there. And that's in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets, stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So he's leaving, uh, he's leaving again. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that, I believe, happens at the uh, yeah, when we come back with him uh, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, just before the Millennium Kingdom. So, as we have studied here, the pattern of what the tabernacle and the temple, temple stood for was missed. Hard to say why, but my first thought was perception. They were looking for a king, not a lamb. John 1.29. There are people, though, that did recognize it. And that was John the Baptist. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There had to be a sacrifice of a, of a, stack, of a nature that uh, would take away the sins of the whole world. Sheep and goats didn't do it. It had to be, it had to be somebody without sin. And, that meant Jesus, and that's why God took on human form in Jesus Christ and came to earth and did perform that function. And jumping down to verses 35 and 36. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. But the King is still coming. And we're looking forward to that day now. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw a heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was faithful and true. In righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. <clears throat> the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That would be us. Have you chosen a name for your horse yet? 
clothed in fine linen. That's uh, white and clean. That's the righteousness that is put on us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of the mouth goes the sharp sword, that was his words, that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And that's when he's going to become a king. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the day he takes his throne, his rightful throne in the uh, Millennium Kingdom. And we will be talking a lot about that as we uh, finish up our study uh, in, uh, in time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, if everybody's uh, in tune for it, I'm thinking of just continuing right in and heading in uh, and do the Millennium Kingdom next. Uh, so you can pray for me on that way. Uh, that would be an interesting study also. And I think that uh, it'll complete the timeline that uh, we are all excited about. So. So for Sunday school, uh, that's what I'm thinking. So we'll be reviewing these verses here, real, uh, probably not this kind of Sunday, but next Sunday. <sighs> and going going into detail about the uh, actual uh, Millennium Kingdom, which is actually in Ezekiel. We'll be in Ezekiel and we'll be a few other places for that study. But most of the, we we'll talk about the Millennium Kingdom is actually in Ezekiel and Isaiah. Uh, it's not just a little bit in Revelation, really. Uh, so let's pray. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for all you've done, Lord. Thank you for this study in Exodus. And I hope I did it uh, did it uh, in honoring to you, Lord. I hope that I uh, was uh, truthful and honest in my uh, approach and that uh, you continue to help me to, uh, to study and to understand your word in a way that's honoring to you. And I want to give you praise and thanks in all you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, so our guys have a great weekend, and I will talk to you either Sunday, uh, I'll see you Sunday, or I will talk to you again Monday morning. So we'll look into Leviticus if you want to read ahead. I'm not sure. I haven't decided. I'll start working on it uh, probably today and uh, Saturday. <laughs> so have a great weekend.